gentlemen. Um, my name is Nelson Dodd. I'm a partner at the Dorsey and Whitney Law Firm and also a member of the board of the National Committee on U.S. China Relations. It's my pleasure on behalf of all my colleagues here at Dorsey and Whitney to welcome you tonight to this program about foreign direct investment in the U.S. Dorsey and Whitney is very proud to be a sponsor of the National Committee and its important work. And we're very happy that you could join us here tonight. Oh, you meant brief. <laughs> the, um, Nelson, thanks. I, I did notice that, that uh, he was doubtlessly, we, we do a lot of programs here, as you know, thanks to Nelson's, Nelson's support. And I noticed the food was up a bit today. It was a slightly higher quality. Is that because of your presence? Was it, <laughs> was it present? No. Yeah, I think if they knew, heard my wife's new restrictions on my calories, <laughs> definitely not for me. But it's, um, you've got, or you, had, you have out front the, these reports, uh, both Two Way Street, the 2018 uh, update, and New Neighbors, um, which is a look at Chinese investment in the United States at a very granular level with analysis per congressional district. I think it comes as no surprise to anybody in this room that we've entered a downturn in the U.S.-China relationship, that we're at a period of really extraordinary difficulty. Hopefully, we will see progress when um, Secretary Mnuchin and Ambassador Lighthizer and Larry Kudlow and Peter Navarro go to China later this week. But I think we have to recognize that we're going to be in a more difficult time period, which makes the report that the Rhodium Group and Dan R Rosen and Tilo Heinemann have put out even more important because in this time of difficulty, data is critical. That when you make policy that's totally missing the data, the policy by definition is not going to be right. So at a time like this to come out with this report when investment both ways is under assault is critical. Now this endeavor is neither easy nor cheap. How many thousands of transactions did you analyze, Dan? Well, altogether, uh, we have a near on 10,000. Around 10,000 transactions at a granular level. So this is, this is not cheap, so I wanna you know, both thank Dan and Tilo for really doing an extraordinary job in putting these reports together because they are really terrific. And then thank the sponsors because without the sponsors, we, this report doesn't get done. Um, you know, we had the honor of both having the China General Chamber and the Shanghai American Chamber as sponsors. Um, and it's the first time, to my knowledge, that both chambers have sponsored a report of any kind. Uh, we have the East-West Bank, who is represented today here, uh, the Star Foundation, Chubb, uh, Perfect World, and the Walt Disney Company that have sponsored these reports, because all of them, in some way, participate in this two-way investment. Let's get to the data and the panel, because really people are, um, we've got a spectacular panel and uh, we've got a report that is full of interesting data. You know, Dan Rosen, Tilo is not with us today, but Dan is with us. Um, and you all have his bio, but he really is the leading authority on Chinese investment in the United States and U.S. investment in China in the United States. And I think those both in the US government, the Chinese government, and the media now rely on the data that he prepares and then analyzes. So I won't go over his whole background except to say he is a board member of the National Committee on US-China Relations. So you'd expect me to be slightly prejudiced in my introduction <laughs> of Dan. But uh, Dan, why don't you take it over? You'll talk and then we'll, we'll go to the panel and then we'll go to some audience Q&A, but thank you all for being with us, and Dan, thanks for preparing this report. Uh, Steve, thank you very, very much. Um, one of the first things I did in my career when I was a much younger guy working at the 
Peterson Institute in the 1990s was go to China and start asking um, uh, business people involved in uh, direct investment into China um, to help me better understand what was happening, why it was happening. One of those people was Steve Orland back in those days. Um, he probably doesn't even remember because I was such a young, insignificant uh, at that time. Um, but it was because of the mentorship of a lot of people um, who I've had the chance to uh, work with um, uh, uh, as a mentee, uh, and then later on nowadays as a board member with some of my, uh, my greatest mentors. Um, it's been absolutely terrific. And this topic in particular has been just so exciting to work on. Um, after the extraordinary trade juggernaut that China was from the 1990s into the 2000s, um, it might seem to some people that all the really exciting stuff in China global economic development had kind of played through and we, we had to get used to things being a little bit more normal now. But actually there are major aspects of uh, economic globalization that haven't even really begun. And this was one of them, uh, outbound direct investment from China to the world. There are, by the way, some others. Portfolio investment from China to the world hasn't started yet. So there's still another uh, lifetime um, of excitement waiting for some uh, junior researcher to come along uh, and, and, and do this kind of stuff. But three years ago, um, Tilo and I started what is today the US-China FBI project. Um, the two reports we're going to talk about tonight are uh, the main uh, elements of that in partnership with the National Committee. We wanted it to have the right home, the right partner, um, to give it uh, the uh, nonpartisan, uh, bilateral uh, flavor that it has had since its inception. One of the things that makes it so, I think, valuable. We anticipated that this was going to be a really important new element of the bilateral U.S.-China relationship, and indeed, really, China's relationship with the world. Uh, and um, we, we did foresee that. And for that, um, I pat us on the back, especially Tila, who I'm sorry cannot be here. Um, and we had the goal, we sat out, to make sure that as it became a bigger topic, and a more important one, that the discussion of the topic was conducted based on objective data, as Steve said, not just on fears, conjectures, and frankly the wrong data representing what was happening in two-way FDI flows. Because there are alternative methods of counting uh, investment activity that were pre prevalent three years ago, which are very good for balance of payments purposes, but they're not very good for asking the question, what can China Inc. do in America, for instance? I won't get into that kind of detail here tonight, that's not the point, but just a for instance, if every Chinese company came out through Hong Kong first before coming to the US, it would never be counted as Chinese. And that was the state of the art three years ago, actually, that Beijing itself said, no, 85% of our FDI is going to Hong Kong, the British Virgin Islands, and Mauritius. Obviously not an accurate reflection of what China Incorporated was doing in the advanced economy world. And so we, uh, we wanted to uh, do better uh, and offer a better framework <coughs> with which to think about these issues, and I think we did. This is the third annual update of the framework that we built. And in uh, three iterations, we've gone from the first one, which just established a new baseline for people to think about, well, what is actually the real level, a more accurate uh, sense of the level of investment in, in both directions, direct investment, which, by the way, we're talking about merger and acquisitions and greenfield building whole new plants. We're not talking about individuals buying personal homes and things like that, right? And we're not talking about buying bonds either. We're talking about companies making commercial investments in another economy. We've gone from setting a baseline year one. Year two, when we were here a year ago, uh, around about now, we were talking about a boom time with extraordinary growth in the cumulative value of flows. And now we're talking about a different version of the narrative what it looks like when things uh, show that they can actually go in reverse. And that this is not a one-way growth story that's going to keep going forever, that it needs uh, work. And it needs a positive political relationship, in fact, between China and the United States, or these kinds of opportunities and trends will not be sustained. Whichever direction the trend is going in, you'll have a better policy debate if you're working with objective data than just your gut feeling about what firms from that other country are up to and doing. So that's what this is for. 
let me walk you through real quick. Too many slides here. I'm going to go through some of them very fast, but just work through the narratives that you'll find in the two studies. The first one we're going to talk about is called Two Way Street, and it is, as this uh, chart uh, captures, a, a database of 27 years of direct investment flows between our two economies. Uh, that is the United States into China in blue and China into the US in red. That peak in red last year, 2016, marked the high water point of deal flow uh, between the two economies, 47 billion of Chinese into the US. This year, the overall story is a 28% fall off in the cumulative value of US to China plus China to the US. And you can see immediately that we're talking two stories here, a flat US story and a Chinese story very volatile that zoomed up and now has zoomed down somewhat. We're going to get into understanding why that was the case, why that <coughs> took place. Um, but that's the overall picture. Let me just remind folks who maybe haven't been here for our previous iterations of this that until just a few years ago, uh, and just until really last year in fact, U.S. into China was more than the other way. And going back three or four years ago, China was barely even out of bed in the morning, hmm. right, in this flow, in this area of economic activity. It wasn't China's time yet to be sending capital abroad. There were too many good uses for capital at home. Now we're in a different era, uh, the potential anyway, should China keep its drawbridge down for a lot of money to go out, is high and it will be high for virtually forever more, I would say. So let's look at each of the constituent pieces of the story here. US FDI into China basically flat last year at around $14 billion um, for the year. It's been that way, more or less range bound like that for the past, as you see, this is six years in a row, that we really haven't had any kind of discernible trend change. Those little tiny, even, even going back to uh, the late 19, uh, you know, late 19, uh, uh, early uh, mid 2000s, I would say, talk about the biggest economy in the world, investing into the second biggest economy in the world, this is really nothing to speak of. We've been more or less flat for a decade here. That is not normal. China has grown by trillions and trillions of dollars of GDP size in those years. And so for the US numbers to be virtually flat and not growing in pace with China says there's something going on there that we need to understand better, why, that, uh, why that's not the case, why we're not seeing growth in FDI to China the way we're seeing, as the US China Business Council put out today, growth on the export side. Not bad last year, despite all of our troubles. Um, pretty strong US export growth to China. Not visible on the, uh, on the FDI side. Main reason for that, there's still very heavy restrictions in China on FDI into the country from abroad, including from the United States. This is OECD data on restrictiveness that uh, measures things in primary, secondary, and tertiary. That's the uh, agricultural and mining is primary, secondary is manufacturing and industry, tertiary is service sector activity. Everything from lower value services to high value services like medical services, engineering, financial services, and things uh, of that nature. And we've had some reduction over the past uh, decade and a half in the level of Chinese restrictions, but compared to how much more sophisticated China's economy is becoming, the birth, you know, the rise of the consumer class in China, still a very restrictive um, picture in China. Looking at last year's data here, and this is where the Rhodium National Committee data set comes in handiest, is understanding what the industry level trends are. What we've done with this chart is looking from bottom to top, we've got sectors which saw a decline in 2017, uh, 2017 relative to 2016. And then the middle set is stable amounts of FDI coming in from China, uh, from US to China, excuse me. And the top there is where we're still seeing some growth. Despite the overall flat, when we look at everything, within that overall, there are these differences. Some are growing and some are, are slowing down, right? And then looking left to right, we have industries which have a small value, medium value, and a high value. Potential for a lot of money, a lot of deal activity. We see that the 2017 story, even keeping things flat, was dependent on just a handful of industries. 
ICT is information and communication technology, interestingly enough. We think of ourselves on the verge of a high-tech, you know, battle between China and the U.S. right now. And indeed, we have some really big challenges um, confronting us in terms of policy and high tech. But the reality is that most big American tech companies are trying to stay built into China's economic future by making additional investments and building themselves into the plan, if you will, finding the right partners and doing more JVs with them, joint ventures, so that they can remain inside um, the family, so to speak. So we still see some considerable ICT activity. Entertainment helped save the day last year, which is largely theme parks right now. Walt Disney, a supporter of this study, uh, they're not the only ones, Great Adventure, I believe, uh, and several others also, able, willing, and ready to put down a significant amount of money to build out a presence to serve tomorrow's consumer. It looked for a moment that some Chinese players doing theme parks we're going to find a way to squeeze foreigners out of the market, but they did not succeed in doing that. And so far, we have a pretty um, open opportunity um, for, uh, for American theme park uh, providers to, uh, to play in China. At the other end of the uh, extreme, I would point out healthcare is a service sector where there's tremendous American comparative advantage. Despite how clumsy we are about our healthcare system here at home, our best healthcare groups are, are trying very hard to play a bigger part in China. Cleveland Clinics, uh, Johns Hopkins International, Catholic Hospitals in the West, all really pushing uh, to uh, build out an opportunity for themselves for the future and finding that it's really hard to get going um, so far. So a lot of latent potential there that hasn't been realized yet. Um, Chinese FDI into the US. Let's turn to that now and look at the flows in the other direction. Um, here we have the individual bars with values uh, since 1990. As I said, it's the past decade that the trend started to take off and then really had a strong pronounced trend pattern right through 2016 of growth here. Um, capping out at last year's $47 billion um, of deal activity. With the lights out, you'd be able to see a little bit better that we have in these bars both acquisitions in the dark red and green fields in the lighter orange color. Overwhelmingly, Chinese FDI into the U.S. is acquisitions, buying existing American firms or non-American firms based in America as well sometimes. The green fields are the story of tomorrow. Once Chinese firms are, are ready and able to build it from scratch, from the ground up, that kind of investment is even better in some ways, we'll talk about in a minute, um, for the American economy. It creates wholly new operations that didn't exist um, previously. But last year, we had this really significant fall off. For the first time in a decade, we had that kind of a step down in activity to a total of about $29 billion of deal activity from $47 billion the previous year, 35% decline. We're gonna talk for a second about why that happened but before we do, let me offer one bit of even worse news. If we look instead of completed deals, which is what the previous slide showed, at newly announced transactions, which is the pipeline for the future, that value of pending transactions fell by 90%. So we really have a very empty pipeline right now of Chinese activity coming in, especially compared to previous years, but even, you know, we have to go back to uh, before 2012 at this point, uh, five or six years ago, um, to see this thin uh, an amount of deal activity lined up uh, to do deals uh, in the U.S. Why did that happen? There's two reasons, and one of them is predominant, and it's this one. Um, the principal reason why, and we call this a double policy punch, if you will, the principal reason why Chinese FDI in the United States fell last year was that China closed the door on outbound investment. 2017 was not a story of CFIUS, of tighter US investment screening, keeping Chinese investment out. Much more to the point, it was a story of regulators in China keeping the money at home for a variety of reasons, which I'll mention one or two of in just a second. Um, it was the end of 2016 where you see that dashed red line. Beijing first imposes informal, Wind, what we call window guidance, calling the banks and saying, 
if those people ask you for dollars to go make an investment out there, tell them that your banker has got uh, the flu and that, that won't be open until next week. But at first it was that kind of stuff. Standing on the air hose is a metaphor people often used um, in China to talk about this as well. By summer 2017, it was being formalized into what it is today, a much more restrictive formal environment for screening outbound investment, in fact. That is in stark contrast to what had previously been a Chinese liberalization trend. There had been almost a big bang in Beijing choosing to open the door to outbound investment. So much so that standing committee members were saying, unless it's a core state-owned company, if it's private firms, it's their business. They've got to make these decisions. It's up to them. They just have to notify us. They don't have to ask for permission anymore. That was China 2014, 2015. By 2016, 2017, that was no longer the story. The story was back to ask for permission, right? There are a variety of reasons for that, which I'm going to get to in just a second, for just a second. The other reason why things started to thin out last year and by the end of 2017 was starting to become a much bigger factor was indeed more strict U.S. screening of inward investments, mm -hmm. not just from China, but not least from China as well. Um, CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, the U.S. Um, body uh, that has responsibility to look at inward investments, uh, acquisitions only, and decide whether there's anything national security concerning about those transactions, earlier in 2017 was still waiting for the new White House to appoint uh, deputy assistant secretaries and basic staff needed to fully staff out, oversee, and provide political cover to that office. So it was taking them a little bit longer to clear transactions. By later in the year, there's a clear pattern of uh, having a higher bar for what could be security concerning. So that we had things like Holly MoneyGram uh, get rejected, uh, certainly semiconductors deals, anything to do with um, uh, semiconductor technology um, getting turned away uh, by the end of uh, 2017. So that was the second factor, but it really, when we look at the overall numbers, it was not the story of 2017. It may be the story of 2018. We'll talk about that in a minute. And I should run to the end so we can maximize the amount of time for the uh, panel here. But taking the same approach to organizing what happened last year, we get this graph for the China to the US picture. Same framework, declining, stable, and growing. Down at the, and low, medium, high values. Down at the declining end, and Constance understands this chart extremely well, the biggest declining high value area of activity, real estate. Also on the declining side, entertainment activity. You may, those of you familiar with the FDI area will recognize that these are some of the areas where Beijing slammed the door on its own companies, doing deals, making transactions in America. In fact, if you look at those, the biggest five Chinese private outbound investors, all of which were making a giant splash in America through 2016, H&A, uh, 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 Fosun, Waldorf Astoria, Anbang, uh, Wanda, uh, theaters, AMC movie, chain entertainment, those are the sectors which got shut down. Now, I'll be curious to hear what others think about this when we turn to this discussion. It's actually not unusual for the most conservative Swiss insurance companies in the world to hold real estate assets. That's what you do. It's a big, giant, liquid, predictable asset pool that's very normal for uh, fixed income asset managing firms with a long portfolio to have a big chunk of. But for the time being, this has been put on the no-no list as far as Beijing is concerned. If you're an insurance company going out to invest in real estate, apparently you're doing something that's not good. Now, last I heard, it's still okay to invest in real estate in China. Has anybody heard that? <laughs> yeah, I think so, right? So it's a very much uh, a, uh, a sort of double standard there, given that real estate still plays a very outsized role in feeding growth inside the country, whereas going abroad to diversify a resource, uh, uh, a real estate portfolio is no longer um, considered acceptable. Um, the Chinese numbers would have been much worse if it weren't for a handful of deals. For example, in transport, we had CIT aircraft leasing um, purchased uh, by a Chinese investor. Um, so that was a standout. Um, we also had a couple other deals 
um, that kept the numbers from falling much more than they did. <laughs> Changing gears just for a second, um, the other study that we're releasing here today is uh, called New Neighbors. And whereas the two-way street database that we just looked at is the broadest possible look at what's happening in both directions over many, many years, the New Neighbors database is as deep as possible, down to the congressional district level. So we see what's happening through the 50 United States. And indeed, I think 98% of all US congressional districts are now hosting some mm -hmm. amount of Chinese direct investment. It's a very broad gauged uh, story. And unlike, for instance, Japanese investment in the 1980s, which almost only went into congressional districts that coincidentally were the districts of congressional committee chairmen who were hmm. in charge of things like tariff policy in particular, uh, the footprint of China Inc. in the US doesn't seem to be just cherry picking out congressional leaders at all. There's both value investing in very poor uh, counties and districts and very wealthy districts, union uh, states and non-union states, uh, coastal states with higher technology activity and middle of the country, more brownfield investment activity as well. So a very diverse story there. Up until last year, this is the job count. We're now up at around 140,000 Americans getting their paychecks from direct majority own Chinese investors in the US. Um, 140,000, it's not that much. I think, Steve, uh, uh, somebody from the Swedish mission in Shanghai, when we uh, talked about this last week, said that by their estimation, over a million Americans are employed by Swedish or Scandinavian um, related firms in the US. Jap Jap Japanese uh, associated firms here, 800 or 800,000 or so Americans. Mm -hmm getting paychecks there. So early days, five years ago, it was 15 or 20,000. Concerning at the moment is that we're flattening out so quickly. There was only a marginal addition last year of about 5,000 American jobs that came from Chinese investment. That's what happens when you take that, you know, 30 or 40 or 50% year on year growth rate that's getting everybody's attention and turn it downwards by a 30% cut. It's amazing in a sense um, that we had any positive um, activity on the jobs um, count last year, but we did have a little bit. Uh, also concerning, in terms of 2017, value of canceled Chinese greenfield projects in the United States. As I said a little earlier, greenfields are really the best kind of inward direct investment. It means building something brand new from scratch. All jobs at a greenfield facility are new jobs. Whereas when an acquisition happens, you're taking 20,000 people or 50,000 who used to work for Smithfield when it was a US company and making them workers at a China invested firm, but there may or may not be net new jobs. As it turns out, actually there often are. Chinese investors in M&A have tended to grow their employment count and reinvest in their, their businesses once they got here, but the really great stuff is the Greenfield stuff, like Volvo, South Carolina, brand new firm doing something from scratch or Fuyao, uh, Ohio, which took an entirely dead old brownfield facility and created new jobs from scratch. Golden Dragon Copper, which we uh, looked at um, down in Alabama and years past in this study as well. But the greenfield deals that we had in our, on our radar screen last year uh, got canceled uh, in droves in 2017. Almost anything that wasn't closed yet in the real estate space um, got put on ice. Um, if it's not completely dead, it's, you know, nobody knows exactly what's going to happen to it, um, whether it's going to come to fruition. That's $6 billion worth of new greenfield activity that we were looking forward to that is now not, not happening um, for 2018. Um, USChinaFDI.com, the uh, address you see there, allows everyone here um, to play with this data themselves, search through it, and uh, put it to work. Uh, in much more fine-grained uh, questions by industry, by certain U.S. states, certain U.S. provinces um, as well. Um, I'm going to spend, if I may, do I have another three minutes? Steve? Yes. I'm mindful. Um, the outlook. Um, just a few quick comments on 2018 and looking forward here. <clears throat> U.S. FDI to China. The problem is 
that we still have restrictiveness on the Chinese side that even if Beijing wants to, is going to be very hard to f make fully reciprocal and liberalize overnight. So we have very high U.S. demands right now. We'll see those in action this week in Beijing. And we have a really long way to go before we're on a level playing field in terms of investment reciprocity. It's going to take a heroic effort by Beijing to get us into you know, the same ballpark in terms of how open our investment regimes are. Look at that in terms of majority versus minority investment stakes. And you get this picture. Um, everything in yellow, this is uh, US firms in China. The yellow by industry is what percentage of firms are limited to working in a minority joint venture position in their own operations in China. So in energy and even in financials entertainment, you've got 65 to 75 percent of all US investors in China are operating as a minority owner of their business. That's highly problematic. And even in uh, areas in the middle there, uh, real estate um, and agriculture and food, for instance, there's still a very large chunk of US businesses that don't own all of their own shop. They were required to have a, a Chinese partner. Working that all out, now Xi Jinping uh, has announced that in a couple sectors, China plans to get rid of these equity caps on foreign investors. But for the most part, it's taking it up to 51% this year and maybe to 100% in three years or five years' time. That's still, what's the reason for that? Why should it take another five years to get some of that done? People are running out of patience, um, I think, out here in the OECD world, in the advanced world. Um, in terms of getting the China to the US numbers back up going forward, we have a pro the problem that whereas two years ago, China had thrown the door open and said, just notify us, as I said, now a formal review and restriction regime has been put in place. And once you do that in a bureaucracy, it's very hard to walk that back to the golden age of outbound investment openness we had a year and a half ago. This is just a quick summary of the encouraged, restricted, and prohibited sectors now for outbound investment that sort of, instead of converging the, out, uh, the, the, uh, the inbound Chinese rules to where we were on the outbound side two years ago, we've converged the outbound system back to where the inbound is so that everything is being managed by the man from Beijing who's here to make sure you don't you know, forget uh, what the national interest is when you decide that it's time to go. Um, abroad. I want to stop there. There's a couple other things here we could talk about, um, but maybe I'll just leave them um, here. I'll leave it on this last slide, actually, um, Steve, which is just reminding us all how much of our fellow Chinese and American business uh, friends and neighbors' money has been put down in one another's economy. So we have a total stock of deals over the years, U.S. into China, of $250 billion, and Chinese into the U.S., of about $140 billion of deals having been done to date. That if we start in our new legislation, things like what's called the PERMA bill being debated in Washington this week, uh, or threats to crack down on Chinese investment uh, that uh, President Trump has made under the 301 investigation, we are basically taking hostage these tens and tens of thousands of business people and their employees who have made the long trek across the Pacific to figure out how to operate as a part of one another's economies. These are precisely the people we should be applauding and celebrating. Uh, they're my heroes, many of them, as I said at the outset. Um, and as we work through these tensions with one another about our economies, um, we need to be really mindful that we don't unnecessarily make life difficult for these hardworking pioneers um, that have built the U.S.-China relationship as we know it. Thank you. Fabulous, fabulous thing. <clears throat> By the way, on that on that chart, it's actually that's a that's a cost basis. You haven't you haven't reappraised the assets in terms of what it would. So the four hundred the, the four hundred is probably close to the five or six hundred. Oh yeah, I mean for for um, for a variety of reasons, we use the original purchase investment values of all this deal flow. We don't inflate it forward, we don't mark it to market, nor do we mark down the divestitures. So what we're showing here is what value of transactions was permissible over the years, 
at original valuation. We could easily, if we wanted to, to, to provide the most conservative possible number for apples to apples purposes. Um, we could easily uh, say that we've got five or six hundred billion dollars of two-way um, assets at risk. All right, well, we're going to expand this to, to include Nelson and Constance. Const you've got their full bios, so I'm not going to go over it except to say that Constance is now the chief economist for KPMG. And Nelson, obviously we're in his, his New York home here, is heads the National Security Law Group and co-head of the Asia Group of Dorsey and Whitney. Um, let me start with, with Constance. Talk about, kind of put this in a macroeconomic um, kind of way for us. What are, what are the implications for kind of the macroeconomic environment of these numbers? So, um, not to diminish, because these are, these are large flows, but um, just to put into context, for example, the, the jobs numbers that Dan gave, we have 87 million jobs in the U.S. economy. So 150,000 is, is, is pretty de minimis, but what's more impressive is the growth rate. So if that growth rate were to continue even at half that pace, right, in 10 years, you'd be looking at over 1.5 million jobs. Um, so it's, it's the fact that, that these changes in policies have stopped that growth rate in its tracks. Um, I should add that uh, the United States is not the largest destination for Chinese outbound uh, investment. So um, if you look at the Syngenta deal, for example, that was 43 billion, I think, I have it in my, yeah, 43 billion. Um, China's largest investment in uh, North America was actually to China, when CNOC pur purchased Next Nexen Energy, Canada, sorry, China's largest investment was in Canada, yes, sorry, 14.3 billion. Um, you know, they, they bought their largest real estate investment was into Germany, um, at Logicor at 13.8 billion. So we're not actually the largest source of China's investment, and um, but the U.S. is the largest source of all global FDI, right? So our biggest FDI investor is the U.K., followed by Canada, um, followed by other OECD countries, and and China is in the in the lower uh, portion of the of the top ten. Um, nevertheless, I think the most important sector where this has impact is in real estate. So. In 2015 and 2016, China was the largest investor in commercial real estate in the United States. So that's where we see, I think, the biggest macro impact. So, and I mean, we don't we don't have. In fact, we should point out, Dan, that we don't have the the uh, personal real estate market reflected in these in these numbers. The houses that are bought, the apartments in New York, or the homes in Los Angeles, etc. Yeah, when John Sheen bought um, uh, more than half of the GM building, that was a commercial transaction. It's a going concern, it's a business investment. When she bought a townhouse on East 63rd Street for a couple hundred million dollars, that doesn't count. That's just personal problem. <laughs> well, and I think that so this irrational purchases, I mean, it's easy to sort of scoff at that and say, well, what is that really? But, but any time where you provide capital at below market rates, you have the potential that it you start to have lots of irrational purchases. This is sort of there's a big fear that quantitative easing on the scale of 14 trillion dollars is artificially low interest rates and has provided some irrational purchases. So this idea that China is saying, listen, we're subsidizing um, some of the financing for these companies, we don't really want that leaking out into other economies. That actually makes some sense to me. So you think these these controls actually from a macro economist point of view are, are not are not crazy well from the point of view of a command economy I think they're not crazy right if I were running a command economy and I were subsidizing financing I might say listen I'm going to put some restrictions on where you can put that financing you're saying China's a command economy <laughs> <laughs> let, let me um, since, since Candace is here uh, uh, Constance is here and um, uh, can appreciate the following point. It's an interesting one. Let me make it. So, you know, part of the reason why China opened the door to this outbound investing in the first place, like five years ago, is that China is actually already a net lender to the world by buying our debt at less than 1% effective return on investment. And so the world is 
putting money into China too, much less than China gives up the world by recycling our currencies back to us. And yet, China actually pays interest to the world despite loaning us money. Because the typical foreign investment in China pays 15%, let's call it, return on investment. And the typical Chinese purchase of a, of a US debt security pays very, 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 very little. So, you know, if China wants to, uh, you know, improve its investment income position, it doesn't really have a lot of choice but to stop being just reliant on plain vanilla government debt that anybody can call a broker and say, buy this for me. And instead, let companies go out there and figure out how to you know, produce productive businesses, especially because it's not going to be able to keep the US customer for socks and underwear. Now that China's a more expensive place to make those than Mexico is, if it doesn't invest here to develop a face-to-face -face relationship with our consumers. So, in the short term, right, there's this balance of payments anxiety that, yeah, we want to stop our companies from going abroad. But that doesn't really solve the long-term Chinese financial problem that we actually need your companies to go abroad so you're not just sending a purchase order for treasuries abroad. Would you agree, Constance, or? Well, I'd add another component to this. So what you're talking about is the balance of payments, and this is tied into national savings. And so China is an excess saver. We're, a, we're not, we're an excess borrower, right? Um, there is a very symbiotic trade relationship. And, and if China were to stop pegging its currency, for example, that would certainly reduce the number of treasuries it would need to purchase. Um, it, would, it would change that current account relationship. It would be what we call an automatic stabilizer. So I think that's not necessarily the way I would look at it. And I, and I think that if you're, um, if, you're, if you're companies that are global brands, of course they're gonna make foreign direct investment in other countries because they're gonna to, going to wanna to establish footholds there. Um, and, and so, I, I don't know, I, I, I think the FDI, while it's a, certainly a, a portion of the balance of payments, the direction of those flows and where that money goes, I, China doesn't have to invest it in the US. As I said, they, they, we're, not, we're not their largest investment uh, destination. Um, they have a current account surplus. They're, they need to send money out of China. They don't necessarily have to send it to the United States. They are gonna to wanna to send it to the place where they're gonna get the highest return on it. Um, as far as the purchase of treasuries that's done by the central bank, that's different. The central banks generally don't invest in non-liquid assets, right? So those are, those are sort of apples and oranges, I would say. We can keep going. We, we could argue this, I'm with Dan on this. I think it's um, the returns that they get it's a question of do you take that money and give it to the private sector and allow the private sector to buy buildings in New York or invest in cool. businesses anywhere. Okay. And it's <laughs> that you, you have to deploy those excess savings. If you deploy it in U.S. Treasuries, you get, today it's gone up a lot, so you get 1%, now it's 2 2.5%. It's not that hard to get a 2.5% return in any kind of investment that you make in the United States, the EU. So China's not a command economy, right? <laughs> <laughs> the question that no, 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 this, this capital is controls, of course. China's a mixed economy. Kind of, China is not a command but, economy. So, I think calling it a command economy is actually, but equating it, the, it actually, undermines kind of those who believe that it's a market-driven economy. There are parts of it that are market-driven. There are parts of it that are state-driven. And calling it a command economy, think of the Soviet <clears throat> Union 30 years ago. You had a state plan, and anything that was in the state plan got got built, got done. But that is not China today, and I don't. And, right. I, and, yes. and the market forces, actually, in many areas of the economy, are predominant. So I think you have to look at it. And should is it really, as you point out, that quantitative easing, subsidized borrowing, subsidized Keith in my old profession, um, where you could borrow at very low rates and you didn't have to make a great investment if you did a little better, you could um, you know, you could get great returns. So does the subsidization that occurs in China, how do you compare it to the subsidization that quantitative easing caused throughout the rest of the world? I, guess I think the answer is you let the markets determine that to the extent that you can. And I think that the, the capital controls that China has put in place uh, are destructive to a lot of their long-term plans. So if you look at RMB internationalization, it has basically been put 
on the back burner, which would have been ultimately a good thing for China. But let me. Well, you can't equate the central bank balances and and with the FDI. The central bank balances are controlled by the central bank. They're not fungible with what what the private companies or self-directed companies are choosing to invest in. So to say that it's either FDI or Treasuries, it's it's completely different sources of funds, right? And 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 that those aren't those aren't fungible. Maybe we could go back to. Oh. Yeah, we'll go back to the top. We could, we'll argue this one tonight over dinner. But let's get to. Um, we're talking a lot about the capital controls. Let's get to the, the other end, uh, which is CFIUS and its effect on, uh, on Chinese investment in the United States. And there has been a lot of publicity uh, recently on this, especially, um, and it's somewhat confused, but the, the recent ZTE order, uh, the rumored new case coming against Huawei, the Qualcomm decision, um, uh, in China, where NXP, the merger of Qualcomm uh, 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 and NXP, was not approved by Movcom and the CFIUS reform debate. So, Nelson, you're the leading expert on this. Would you kind of try and enlighten us? And are those things connected, or is are they kind of each individual arbitrary decisions that create a false picture? So, you know. Having a fondness for history, I'll begin back at the beginning of CPS when it was adopted in the late 1980s, at a time when we were worried about another great Asian power rising very quickly and possibly buying up uh, America, uh, not the least of which was Rockefeller Center a few blocks away. So the, that law was adopted in a narrow scope to regulate investments that would touch US national security. And by and large, for the 30 years that the law has been in effect since 88, um, the professional staff inside the government, mainly at Treasury, but also in the other agencies, have exercised a, an enormous degree of professionalism. Uh, roughly 200 to 300 cases a year get processed by that agency. So it's a tiny, tiny fraction of the FBI activity in the US, You know, probably less than 1% by value the deals done in America go through the CFIUS review process because historically the posture of the professional staff in the government and of each president that has supervised this process has been to use the law not as in some other countries that have a net economic benefit test statute but rather a pure national security statute. The law was tweaked about 10 years ago um, in a piece of legislation called FINSA, and it added um, the concept of homeland security and critical infrastructure. So things that were historically pure, you know, military type technologies and so forth, added to that were things <coughs> like buying up our electric power grid, buying up our highway or uh, canal systems, buying up uh, bridges and uh, key, you, water utilities and things like that. And so you began seeing a little bit more uptick in the activity level of, of CFIUS. So against that backdrop, we have to look at the way that CFIUS has approached China through, I think, clear eyes. It is not, uh, how do I say it? In the current political climate, it's very tempting to ascribe the tightening of CFIUS to the Trump administration and the statements of Mr. Navarro and, and others in the administration, Mr. Lighthizer, Mr. Ross. Um, but in fact, if you look carefully at CFIUS activity, even during the Obama administration, there were already signs that investments in semiconductor deals, for instance, were going to be turned down, or at least scrutinized very, very carefully. And there were a number of deals that were turned down, even in the Obama era CFIUS um, affecting advanced U.S. technologies. So what you have is a continuation of a high degree of sensitivity now. And I think one can easily say that the ZTE case, the Huawei case, the, the Qualcomm situation, all of these things, if you look for a pattern, you can see a pattern. That is, the way to conduct, connect all these dots is that the Trump administration has laid out very clearly 
in its December 2017 National Security Strategy document that there are two overwhelming geopolitical and existential threats to the United States. One is posed by Russia, the other is posed by China. And the strategy document, which is available on the White House website, goes into some considerable detail about why, in particular, they have targeted China uh, for that view. Subsequent to that, Secretary Mattis of DOD released another study, which is entirely consistent with annual reports issued by China for at least the last 15 years. Congress mandates that the Department of Defense issue a white paper on U.S.-China security relations every year. And like every year, like clockwork, they issue this paper, along with a little disclaimer about how many tax dollars it took to write the paper. <laughs> but um, the theme, and I read this report because I'm a masochist, um, cover to cover every year when it comes out. It's sort of required reading for people in my field. And it's no surprise, year after year after year for well over a decade, the Pentagon takes the view that China is changing and expanding very rapidly, that it expects to enhance its military forces, particularly the PLA, in a proportionate way to the size and scale of its economy. And so as it modernizes the PLA, it seeks to develop an indigenous capacity for military infrastructure inside China. That is, they want to have their own planes, they want to have their own tanks, they want to have their own missiles in a way that makes them totally independent of external technology and to be able to build it all themselves so they can defend what they perceive as their legitimate national interests. Those interests have expanded as China has become more intertwined with the global economy, and in particular because its energy pipeline now extends all the way to the Middle East. And whereas it used to be the United States that was so concerned about having the security of its energy pipeline, now it's China that's concerned about that energy pipeline. It feels, therefore, it needs potentially military force, particularly in the Navy, and particularly with modern naval assets for a blue water Navy, be able to defend the flow of energy that's coming into China because China, unlike the United States, is definitely not energy independent and depends extremely hard on external assets, more and more from the Middle East. So in that context, the DOD takes the view and has taken the view for years that China will get its military technology by hook or by crook, if I can just use the short phrase. They will buy it, they will borrow it, they will copy it, and if necessary, in the, in the DOD's point of view, they will steal it. And so we have here in the Trump administration uh, somebody who's really willing to listen to that worldview about uh, China, and that drives almost all of these different decisions that you're seeing now. The Qualcomm decision, the ZTE case, which is all about stealing uh, technology and misappropriating it in a way contrary to U.S. law. So that's my opening. By the way, I, re I referred to the wrong Qualcomm decision. The Qualcomm decision was the one blocking the acquisition by Broadcom. I right. referred to the Chinese decision uh, by Mofcom not to approve the Qualcomm NXP decision. So Qualcomm is, is, uh, is much in the news. Um, Has the CFIUS, Nelson, has the CFIUS bot process kind of worked well up to now? Does it need reform with respect to China? I think practitioners like myself who work in front of CFIUS regularly, and I've, I've done filings in CFIUS since 1988, year one of the, of the law. So I would say it's an extraordinary professional process. If you go back through uh, the journalistic history, there's never been a single leak of documents from CFIUS filings. And we're talking about thousands of filings involving billions and billions of dollars of deals. Knowing in advance how CFIUS is leaning or how it will rule, you know, could make an inside trader instantly rich if they had that kind of information. And yet, and still, it's never leaked. Uh, I've never had an unprofessional encounter in 30 years with CFIUS staff doing deals, even Chinese deals. 80% uh, of our Chinese deals have been cleared by CFIUS. 
in our firm. And I think most law firms have a record of, of roughly at that same level. Um, so if I take your lawyer's hat off, policy person, does it need reform? Has the world changed so much? Yes, I think you could you could honestly say that it could be updated and that there is some room, whether FIRMA, which is the legislation Dan referred to, is the right prescription or not, uh, you know, it's certainly debatable and, and I'd be happy to debate that here. Dan. <clears throat> Offer a, um, uh, an, a, an extension of um, what Nelson just said. It's very, that um, I agree with him so much. And that is that to the extent that the United States needs to seriously consider modifying somewhat the existing CFIA system, really so, so does everybody else in the world, including China. And the reason I have in mind is that <coughs> even more than our concerns about China, it's the nature of technology has overrun the traditional boundaries of what CFIUS is looking for, the theory of how we could be vulnerable uh, from uh, foreign participation in technology or just the nature of technology has gotten ahead of where policy risk managers really are. So things we never imagined could be concerning on a national security basis uh, three years ago, like social media, right? Today, we think may have fundamentally subverted our system in ways that we're only coming to fully appreciate, right? And so, you know, that's but not those just were, those our were worry. U those were by U.S. companies, foreigners manipulating U.S. companies. It wasn't because it was a foreign company in the United States. That's my point. There's the part of part of what's at issue here is China coming of age and a level of sophistication at this moment in time. And that does give rise to a security analysis that's going to have to happen. We anticipated that for many years, all including the, the defense community here, uh, deep thinkers in political science everywhere, knew that it was a matter of time before there was going to be this testing of intentions, right? But on top of that, the evolution of technology and the way it can create risks to us as a society, risks to our power grid suddenly coming down all at once, or our uh, aviation control system being taken over by hackers, you know, for fun, or for people, you know, demanding a bribe, uh, taking for ransom, uh, a hospital's uh, information and data, right? These things are actually happening right now all over the world. And they're not China things, but China's also a very big player in information technology, and the U.S. is concerned about China, and so how you can't really separate these things from one another this general concern about technology and how it creates new risks, and the specific concern of whether China would, um, would take advantage of those vulnerabilities to pursue its interests, right? So it's a very big, complicated problem we have. But one more thought on this, and this is something that Kilo and I have been saying here uh, as loudly as we can, we could redouble the robustness of our security screening by an order, you know, we double it or triple it, that much more intense, our screening, and there'd still be room to double, triple, quadruple the amount of Chinese investment into the United States. The vast majority of potential investment flow is not going to be problematic at the end of the day. It may need a little mitigation, there's all sorts of things that may be required, but we're at a very early stage of two-way direct investment flow between our two economies. And there, anyway, this is what I think, Nelson. I don't know if you agree. Maybe you don't think of it in the macro, or maybe Constance, you have a macro view on this. But you know, forty-seven billion dollars, as Constance said, forty-seven billion billion dollars at the peak so far of Chinese second biggest economy in the world into the first biggest economy in the world. That's the value of one single deal, Syngenta. That's the best we can do. A single transaction of world scale. Obviously not. Right? The question of whether five of those a year would be too many. Not necessarily, right? Nelson, did you want to comment? Well, I have to agree with Dan in terms of the, the, the macro numbers, and I'll defer to Constance as well, because I think she might have had a comment on that. Um, I think, you know, 
a lot of expectations have been loaded onto this legislation that Dan was referring to called FIRMA, Foreign Investment Risk Review Management Act. Um, and it's a compilation of a lot of different ideas that have been accreting over the last five or six years, some going all the way back to a proposal that was released in 2012 by the Security Review Commission in Congress. Um, I think, frankly, it, it is vast overkill from a policy standpoint and will not only affect Chinese inbound investment, but I think for the New York business community, it will, in fact, affect foreign direct investment from all over the world because it, it doesn't say that this is just a China law. This says it's, it's going to cover all foreign direct investment in the U.S. So it will affect the deals from, from our largest investment partners like the U.K. and Canada and Germany and France and Japan and Korea and everybody else. Um, there are so many mechanical details that I think most practitioners and most people in the investment community would say are fine if you choose to expand the review period a little longer give the government a little more time to look at some of these deals, put a different deadline on state-owned enterprises because those bring special security issues with them regardless of which country owns the company. If it's a national government, then it's not quite the same thing as a purely private sector investment. There are a lot of those mechanical tweaks that would be helpful, um, but there are some things that the legislation proposes, for instance, that all joint ventures will now be subject to this review potentially, which means not only joint ventures in the U.S., but joint ventures offshore. So that means that if General Motors wants a joint venture overseas, or 3M wants a joint venture overseas, or Honeywell wants a joint venture overseas, you know, that, that deal will now be subject to CFIUS review. Even if that deal is going into Korea, or going into Japan, or going into Thailand, all of those joint ventures are now potentially inside this agency. In addition, they unbind the law from U.S. export control laws. Export control laws are very specific and very concrete about what kind of technology is considered to be important to U.S. national security. There are two sets of regulations that have been around for a long time that industry knows this is a regulated technology, this is not a regulated technology. This law will unbind the connection for CFIUS purposes from U.S. export control laws, and it will be basically any technology the CFIUS deems a critical technology, because it says it's a critical technology, will be a critical technology. And industry can't work that way, because they have no idea whether their technology is going to be critical. You know, there's no, there, there, there's no requirement that they publish that list. There's no requirement that anybody in the private sector knows what that list is. And that's an impossible way to run the government and run public policy. And nobody in the industry will know, and so what will happen is everybody will have to line up and go get reviews done. And these are not going to be inexpensive, especially if it's a small venture. This legislation creates the ability to charge up to 300,000 US dollars per filing. So if you're doing a two or three million dollar deal and you tax it 300,000, to clear it, that will kill a lot of deal just by the transaction cost because there's no economic return for that. You know, it is a very, very punitive system. At some point, Constance, does it affect asset pricing? If we restrict Chinese investment into the United States at some price, at some point, does it affect the price of the assets that they would buy? Because they got to get sold to other buyers at lower prices. But what happens to the U.S. economy? Well, again, it's a it's the biggest place where China was the significant player, and where they were the largest player for several years was real estate. And and again, when I say I can understand the perspective of China referring to these irrational purposes, it doesn't mean that I endorse the policy, right? I'm, I'm simply saying that. If you look at history, you look at what happened when Japan was investing in U.S. real estate because they had a large um, current account surplus and we had a large current account deficit and there was that same somewhat symbiotic relationship, they bought a lot of real estate at the top, right? 
And, and, if, and as I mentioned earlier, cap rates have gotten to very, very low levels. And certainly in tier one cities, they've gotten extremely low um, when you look across a whole uh, different variety of types of real estate investment. And so other players weren't necessarily in bidding for that, uh, in bidding necessarily for those investments in the last year because things have gotten kind of rich. So I would say in the case of real estate, it's a market where things got very rich, and the absence now of Chinese players is actually making it at prices that are attractive to say, for example, the Canadian pension fund, the Norwegian pension fund, some of the um, uh, Middle Eastern investment funds um, that are big sources of US real estate investment. So, I, but uh, over the long term, this, this firma is, is very, very dangerous, and in general, I think limiting capital flows and limiting FDI is not a good idea. If you look at any textbook of how to build a developing, how to develop a developing economy or how to expand an economy, what you want is foreign direct investment. And in a way that's preferable to portfolio flows because portfolio flows can be hot and they can run out at the sign of trouble. But real estate is not a liquid investment, right? It's a stable long-term investment and, and all these FDI investments are stable long-term investments. It's what you, it's what you want to encourage. And do you think this will kind of deter the Chinese from op the openings that we're beginning to see in the investment uh, climate in China, autos, financial services? Do you think it'll incentivize them to do them? You think that's why they're doing them, Steve? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely an open question. No, right? I, I actually think it's they're doing them because the, the president of China recognizes that they're winners and losers with these restrictions. The winners are the, are the people, and the losers are the protect are the incumbents who have been supported by these restrictions. It's the old, you know, and they kind of want to give the benefits. If you think of financial services restrictions, who are the winners in financial services restrictions? The winners are the incumbents. The loser are every borrower, every equity issuer, and every consumer in all of China. And they've recognized they gotta they gotta give more. It helps in their development. It's been slow, but they recognize it. Yeah. So I mean, so w we will be able to see whether that seems to be the primary motive. In uh, uh, if they actually follow through with all the other things they need to do to truly um, focus on consumer welfare as the main uh, as the main objective here, even in the financial services opening that has recently been announced here. Very, people are very excited about it. And then they've just seen that actually only, for example, asset managers with 100 billion yuan of deposits in China are gonna be permitted to have 100% ownership. So only 30 or 40 financial institutions can possibly hope to be uh, competing in this marketplace if these um, net asset value standards are gonna be applied. So we're right back to it's great for the big guys in China, not so great for the medium-sized companies that were on their way up, including foreign, um, who are looking forward to a chance to finally compete in this marketplace. So it's got some of the right, and this is the basic problem right now, and the reason why there's the cloud hanging over the two-way direct investment opportunity is so thick and dark gray, that even to the extent that we do have some glimmers of you know, light shining through the clouds, those are, you know, a bit um, uh, hard to be confident in because of counter indications that are still kind of um, cloud, continuing to cloud the uh, cloud the outlook. Nelson, you have a view on that one? I don't. <laughs> I don't. I'll defer to constant on that. What areas do you think, Dan? So. If you're going to exclude ICT, I guess your chart, you're, you're, there still is this whole huge area where Chinese companies can still invest in the United States. What are some of the examples of that? You know, one one of the let me make a general statement, and then I'll maybe suggest not exclusively what some of the winning sectors ought to be. But one of the part of the genius of the traditional American approach, to training, the CFIUS approach, was that we didn't have a negative list. We didn't say this industry, energy, is off limits. We said, well, whether it's energy or uh, pig farming, there could be a national security issue if the pig farm is right abutting a, a naval weapons testing station. 
and it could be energy, and it's just digging coal out of the ground or cleaning it or something like that, and that really wouldn't be national security concerning in the United States of America. And so we, the, the system was designed, the default was yes. There had to be a really clear reason to say no. It really, and it wasn't industry specific. Even in the FINSA uh, regulation of 10 years ago, most recent re-legislation of the whole process, the very general categories of critical infrastructure. It wasn't really a specific list of this sector's off limits, that sector's off limits. So now we'll see what happens here um, in the period just ahead. There's a real possibility that we will start um, not even you know through FINSA, but a whole separate uh, level, a layer of, uh, of regulation being applied here that applies a reciprocity standard. That to force China to level that playing field, we're going to start saying the no to things that have no national security relevance at all. And that's part of the threat that's laden in the President's 301 uh, order, which has room for additional FDI screening that nobody knows exactly what that's going to mean yet. It looks like maybe a bit of a threat tactical thing here. Nobody's quite sure we're comfortable. But um, so it's possible that we start going the wrong way in terms of, you know, we're going to do it the Chinese way because they're doing it that way, even if it's not in our own interest, frankly. All that said, there ought to be, in uh, our opinion, hundreds of billions of dollars of additional Chinese investment um, in all of the industries where there are currently OEMs, original manufacturers, of the things Americans consume. So apparel, light electronics. Uh, these things are not big manufacturing sectors in America today, right? Nor are they likely to be tomorrow. And yet, Chinese don't have any brands on the ground, right? Um, Walmart is where Chinese apparel gets sold here. There is no unique look of China yet. Maybe it'll be uh, Margie Young's Esquil Group that comes up with a brand and, and moves it over here, who, know, who knows? But anywhere you find a Chinese surplus in the advanced economy world, there's a case to be made for them having a more of a service presence on the ground, which should translate into many, many billions of dollars of investment. And then real estate, we got it. And there's plenty of room to absorb more Chinese money, even if it crowds the Norwegians out a little bit and some savvy New Yorker gets a little richer than he deserves to get. Let me open the uh, floor to questions. And oh, but last one, last one, Dan, an easy, easy one. What's your prediction for 2018? How much Chinese investment in the United States? Uh, so the way through the year. Tilo and I have a, another hundred dollar bet. Um, Tilo thinks it's going to fall another 30 percent from 2017 levels, mm -hmm. and I'm saying less. It'll fall less than 30 percent. Based on the pipeline right now. You should cover Tilo's side of the bet, not mine. <laughs> really looking grim. That said, if you know we have the biggest, the hugest deal ever uh, announced, a, a new May Fourth movement um, this week, um, then there's the potential to get back to that really exciting uh, upside uh, opportunity. Even as I say, even if we close out a lot of the high tech semiconductor stuff, there's plenty of room. U.S. to China. Um, there's hundreds of billions of dollars of U.S. business that the American investor doesn't own their own company because they're forced to have a JV structure. If only half of them are allowed to buy out the rest of their own business, we're talking about getting that blue line up, you know, doubling it from 14 billion to 30 billion. That could happen pretty easily, I think. Um, likewise, China back to the U.S. easily get back to the 40, 50, 60 billion dollar level um, if we just let real estate. Get normal again. Steve, can I add a footnote? Sure. So, um, I, as a former federal prosecutor myself, I don't think it's, I can let this one pass. But, uh, the, recently, you've been reading about the ZTE case, and then there's some additional concern about whether Huawei will be up subject to the same thing. I urge all of you just to Google the ZTE case and look for the Justice Department page that announced that case, because at the bottom of the Justice Department announcement about the settlement, they give you all of the documents. They give you the, the complaint. They give you the entire full text of the settlement agreement. The 
that was signed by ZTE. So you can read for yourself what ZTE admitted publicly to the government that led the government to find them $1.2 billion. That was the largest fine ever assessed in US history for these kinds of violations. But ZTE not only broke the law, it intentionally broke the law. It set up a special business unit inside the company to break the law. It set up a second special unit to burn the documents <laughs> to cover up that they had broken the law. And they swept their system every night and each employee that was in that unit had to sign a special non-disclosure agreement agreeing that if they ever broke the secret and confessed that they were destroying documents, they would owe the company a lot of money. And so this was a very, very concerted effort. And then more recently, just within this past month, CTE was barred from buying any US origin technology goods for another seven years. That was because as part of the settlement, they agreed to do certain things which included disciplining the people that were involved in the scheme. What the Commerce Department found out was instead of disciplining those people, they were given special commendations and bonuses and promoted. <laughs> and so even though they had promised the US government that they were gonna discipline these people for breaking the law and very intentionally breaking the law, they instead it was just the exact opposite. And when the government found this out, I, I, I read a lot of these documents for a living. I rarely see so much anger and so much frustration in the US government documents. They, they went on for almost 12 pages of the order talking about what GT had done to lead to this conclusion that the only outcome possible was to collect the entire fine of 1.2 billion, much of which had been put aside and suspended. On the, on the assumption that ZTE would clean it up its act. And so it's not, and it didn't. And it didn't. Uh, so it's very important to, in order to have a balanced view <coughs> that the Chinese, to some extent, are doing this to themselves in, in, in behaving in a manner in cases like this one that lead to the, to the dark suspicions held by a lot of government regulators. Yeah. And it really, Feed, it's a perfect storm. I mean, it just feeds into that dark narrative, and it doesn't have to, but once they start pulling these kinds of facts out, um, that's why there are more and more prosecutions. Today, I'd say on an average month, there are at least two federal indictments around the country against Chinese American scientists or engineers working inside American companies or from working for American universities. It's like clockwork. Every couple months, the FBI drops another case. Uh, Steve, and could you give us the website again? Um, I, I will make it available through Steve and, and the National Committee for those who signed up. Of course, then you have the case today where the Department of Commerce ruled that the NOAA scientist who had been dismissed was dismissed. The Chinese American NOAA scientist who was dismissed was dismissed wrongly. Yes. So you have you a have lot of cases of yeah. racial profiling are occurring, and it really makes it really difficult for the Chinese American like many of you and myself. By the way, I criticized the Chinese media for their coverage of CTE because they made it a U.S.-China relations issue, and in fact, it's not. It really was a question that if it had been a French company or Japanese company or anything, the same sanctions would have been like. Keith. Um, you had a slide. Sorry. Uh, there was a slide, and just before you um, finish the formal presentation, that was interesting. Um, you were delineating the policy prescriptions inside China, what foreign direct uh, areas were encouraged and what were discouraged. Uh, you started off with Belt and Road being obviously one of the areas that were encouraged. And you couldn't, didn't have time to read them all, but I was interested in, from a policy perspective, what kind of foreign investments are more likely to uh, be exempted from the capital control and, and receive permission. Uh, and um, you'll find the slide um, on online with these materials uh, that summarizes China's new OF outbound uh, direct investment regime. Um, uh, Belt and Road, um, anything that promotes China's exports of, of its overcapacity industries, precisely what Western companies fear um, is being 
promoted here. Anything in the high tech or advanced manufacturing, um, overseas research and development centers are all encouraged. Um, oil, gas, mining, and other energy uh, are still on the encouraged list after evaluation of economic benefits to China. So that's very much state guidance in terms of what's okay and what's not. Um, agricultural investments, which means plantations overseas that will bring commodities back to Chinese farmers and people. Um, and service sector investments in business services, cultural logistics, certain types of financial investments are the areas that are being encouraged. And then of course, any country that is particularly on the friendly list right now and is getting a special you know, reward for being supportive of Chinese interests tends to be have a special FDI cedar fund that can be set up um, in that country as well. So that's sort of an implicit. Could you, could you clarify what those financial industries are and what those countries are? Um, uh, I could. Um, just off the top of my head, for example, there's a China Israel fund, a China France fund, a China Brazil fund, a China Belgium fund that immediately come to mind. There's a China. Uh, Abu Dhabi fund um, as well. Um, they tended to follow visits of Chinese prime ministers in the wake um, of those visits, um, I would say. Um, they're often done in partnership with local uh, private equity companies um, as well. Um, and then there's general support for Chinese financials, going abroad, thus being in a position to help fellow Chinese companies to make the jump. So Bank of China works really hard here in the US to uh, offer financial services to other Chinese companies that are more accustomed to talking to a Bank of China um, professional than they are yet to dealing with, say, city people or, or something like that. So, see that, that last rule applies to all the major banks, ICBC yeah. and you know, uh, other others. It's a $5 billion fund with your former employer at the CIC, Goldman Sachs and CIC, to encourage small and middle-sized enterprises to expand in America expand into China. Other questions? Oh, this is a first. <laughs> what effect on Chinese public opinion do these capital controls have? Um, interesting question. What effect on Chinese public opinion have the capital controls have? have? Um, well, certainly, the center has gotten everybody's attention because it's not just capital controls. In like three out of five cases, it's arresting the CEO of the company that was sending the capital abroad, right? Um, and now forcing them to divest some of their significant overseas portfolio um, of assets. CEFC is the one most recently in the news, for example. Yeah, the Walder. Well, the Walder Astoria is, is, is a stranded asset now. You know, I mean, I think. Maybe interesting, in addition to the capital controls, Chinese public opinion started to get mixed feelings about Chinese companies creating jobs abroad rather than keeping all those jobs at home. Fuyao Glass, which we mentioned before, um, ran into some, some tricky press at home about why are you, if you're paying Americans more than you pay Chinese to do the same work, which is what the CEO had to do in order to get his toehold going in Ohio, um, why is that? That's not fair. You know, we had the same debate in the 1970s and 80s, certainly the 80s I remember when I was a kid, um, the runaway plants debate. Maybe we shouldn't, and now Trump has really brought that debate back, right? Maybe we don't want American companies going global. Uh, maybe we want them doing everything here at home as much as possible. Right? I would add a, a footnote to Dan's comment. I think the public opinion in China is to some extent segmented by which stratum of Chinese society you're referring to. The capital controls have not only limited these large investments, but they've also limited the flow of personal savings out of the country quite substantially. And you can see it in the drop off in, or slowing down anyway, of uh, large scale purchases of real estate, personal. And how do people feel about that? I mean, what, how does that affect the, the feeling, people's feelings towards the the government. Well, I, I'm going to defer to people like <laughs> or, or, or Steve who have probably a better, better feel for that. I mean, anecdotally, my sense is they don't like it because 
they don't find enough return and they don't have enough security, you know, in investments in China. And that's the reason they're making these kinds of decisions with their wallets or want to. Yeah, and certainly, I mean, if you're, uh, let's say, an insurance company, right, you want to have the broadest possible selection of assets to invest in, especially real estate assets. And the returns are high on U.S. real estate assets. It's, they're, even if you live through a bad cycle, they tend to be generally, you can live through the cycle and you're not too levered, you end up making money. Most U.S. wealth, uh, U.S. family wealth, is, is built on real estate. There's real, real estate holdings in all components of people in the in the Forbes uh, Fortune 500 list, right? And so, or, or Fortune 50 or whatever it is. But in any case, so I think if you think about who are those investors in those insurance companies to the extent they know about this, it's not, it's not a good thing. But I suppose if you were in these other now promoted sectors, let's say you're in technology or artificial intelligence or biotech, right? You're probably a little happy that some funds are coming your Yeah, I would just say, you know, this is not supposed to be permanent. It really isn't, right? I think Beijing would love not to have had to impose this draconian closing of the door over the past couple of years. It's because of the balance of payments situation got out of hand. And they were looking at the writing on the wall uh, in less than 18, in about 18 months, a full trillion dollars of their foreign exchange reserves will land abroad, right? That's very rational on the part of the people who got that money out of the country, from the center's perspective, it was very alarming. And so it was messy way to put the kibosh, kibosh on that for the time being. It has big productivity consequences that companies can't do rational things now. And it also has an effect on high net wealth Chinese who, one way or the other, they're gonna diversify their wealth a little bit. They're not gonna keep 100% under the party's glare off forever, right? And so it's not a sustainable situation. Uh, it's a temporary fix to a problem, and it's kind of characteristic of the challenges for China now at this new middle income level it's arrived at. Um, it's going to have to be dealing with this on an ongoing basis. I think we have reached seven. Thank our panel for a very interesting...